Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Filed. If this is your first time listening in, I'm your host, Anna. Typically, Filed has brand new episodes come out every Friday so that you can enjoy every Filed Friday, but we will be taking a little break next week so we can accommodate for some life things. So you will not be hearing from us for another two weeks, but if you want to go ahead and keep up with our show in the meantime, you can hop over onto Instagram or Facebook and follow us at The Filed Podcast. And if you end up loving our content, please, please, please leave us a review and tell somebody about it. We want to keep growing and we need you in order to do that. Our show is now available on Spotify, YouTube, Amazon Music, and Apple. We are very excited to be saying that because it has definitely been a hot mess, but it is finally figured out. Also, today we have a very special guest in the studio. This is my mom. Hi, guys. We wanted to experiment with more of a conversational style episode, and I feel like recently she has gotten more into true crime, and so she decided to come in and listen. I'm excited. I want to go ahead and jump into this week's story, but I do have a little disclaimer. This episode does contain graphic details about harm to children, including sexual assault. We understand that this can be a very hard and heavy content to consume, so if you are not in the mindset for this topic or if it's just not a topic you want to hear about, please go ahead and exit this episode and we hope you join us in two weeks. All sources for this episode are linked below in the show notes if you want to go check those out. This week, we are going to be discussing how one teenager's heinous actions led to a first-degree murder conviction. This is the story of Jeremy Strohmeyer and Sharice Iverson. Welcome to The Filed Podcast. So our story starts in the mid-60s when Winnie was in her 20s. Um, She set off for California to work as a social worker for the Catholic Youth Organization. She was absolutely in love with California and felt thrilled about her decision to move there. Around the same time in 1966, a young 20-year-old John was retiring from the Air Force and was sick of the cold weather in New Jersey. Can you relate? Absolutely. (laughs) He, too, decided to move to California and accept a job there at Continental Airlines. So he was a pilot in the Air Force and then was going to go work for Continental Airlines. Both John and Winnie would end up living across the street from one another, and soon they would be interested in each other. John finally found the courage to ask Winnie out on a date, and a week later he told her he loved her. (laughs) So... The couple stayed together and ended up getting married when they were both 26, and it was 1970. Six years later, Winnie gave birth to her daughter, Heather, and shortly after, the couple began reaching out to a social worker to start the adoption process. Why? They kind of always had this dream of having one of their own and then adopting another, so as soon as they had Heather, they were like, let's go for the adoption. Okay. On October 11th, 1978, Jeremy Strohmeyer was born, and 18 months later, Winnie and John were more than excited to welcome their newly adopted son into their home. This adoption would finalize the Strohmeyer's perfect family of four. In 1996, his family decided to settle in Long Beach, California, after spending a year in Singapore for Winnie's work. When the family arrived in Long Beach, Jeremy was around 18 and was enrolled in the 11th grade at Woodrow Wilson High School. At this time, Jeremy had everything going for him. His family was considerably wealthier than most. It was rumored that Winnie and John consistently brought in a six-figure salary and frequently took advantage of the luxuries that it provided. They had a maid, their own airplane, they took vacations on major cruise lines, and owned luxurious vehicles. Jeremy also excelled academically. He maintained a 3.5 GPA, made a 1360 on his SATs, which I don't know what that means necessarily because we take the ACT in the South, but, and he also took AP classes throughout high school. 
he wrote poetry, and even built his own computer. This hard work throughout school was to aid him in his ability to become a pilot, which is a passion that he shared with his father. And his ultimate dream was to attend the Air Force Academy. In addition to academics, Jeremy also played varsity volleyball because his favorite teacher, who Jeremy referred to as Crutch, was the coach. So this guy literally is the peak of high school, has it all. Sounds like it. During his junior year at Woodrow Wilson High School, he became very close with his friend and computer classmate, David Cash. The two became inseparable and even agreed to take a trip with David's father for Memorial Day weekend in May of 1997. During their trip, David's father decided to stop at the Prima Donna Casino just south of Los Angeles to gamble for a little bit. In the morning of May 25th, the boys were talking to a few teenage girls when Jeremy noticed a seven-year-old girl in a blue dress and cowboy boots throwing wet paper towels back and forth with another little boy in the arcade area of the casino. Jeremy picked up one of the wads and began playing with them. For about 11 minutes, Jeremy played with the little girl, which included a game of hide and seek. Jeremy told her that the only place that he wouldn't be able to find her was the ladies' bathroom. So at 3.47 that morning, the little girl entered the bathroom. A few seconds later, Jeremy went in after her and David followed him. Jeremy and the little girl were throwing wet paper towels at each other when she picked up the yellow wet floor sign and accidentally grazed Jeremy's arm. Something in that moment changed in Jeremy. He picked up the little girl, took her into the handicapped stall with his hand covering her mouth. Obviously scared, the little girl kept struggling and Jeremy responded with, shut up or I will kill you. David went into the stall next, the next stall over and jumped on the toilet to peer over the dividing wall. He told Jeremy to let go and was reaching over the stall in an attempt to interfere. He even at one point knocked Jeremy's hat off and was tapping on his forehead, which apparently Jeremy just kept looking at him with this like blank stare of, I have, I have no, like, there was no consciousness of what he was doing. Yes, like there was a face of, he wasn't there. D like David was not there. Um, David wasn't or Jeremy wasn't? Jeremy was looking at David like David wasn't there. Oh. After he had knocked Jeremy's hat off, he then got off the toilet and left the bathroom with Jeremy and the little girl inside. Why? No one knows. Um, even he was like, I don't know, like I just... So, and there's a few comments that we'll talk about later that David had said because they're just so out of pocket that... It's mind-blowing, but so he leaves the bathroom, and from the time that he entered after Jeremy until the time he left was only two minutes. So this whole interaction, and then Jeremy picking her up, taking her in the stall, David trying to interfere only took two minutes. Like, that's how quickly it escalated. So then after he leaves, um, David took a seat on a bench outside the arcade until Jeremy joined him. David told Jeremy that his father was waiting and that it was time to go. How long had he sat on the bench waiting for Jeremy? You're about to find out. Okay. So, after a brief pause, David asked what had happened, and Jeremy looked at him and said, I killed her. No way. After 24 minutes in the bathroom, Jeremy Strohmeyer had murdered seven-year-old Sharice Iverson. What? All the details previously stated are true about Jeremy. He was well-rounded. And he was from a wealthy family in California. However, as you hear all the time, Jeremy lived separate lives. During his time at Woodrow Wilson High School, he conjured up quite the commotion. He began drinking heavily, partying, which led to using tweak, which I have never heard the word tweak before as a reference to a drug. Do you know what that is? I have no idea. So apparently it's just amphetamines, but I don't know exactly what it is includes but I just had never heard of that. I didn't know if it was like a 90s term um he was never on time for curfew he completely stopped respecting his parents he was isolating himself and had completely changed from the sweet boy they had adopted by now Jeremy was spending most of his time under the influence of some kind of substance um there was also a lot of stories about him being with like prostitutes and even like 
I don't want to say heinous, but just being really disrespectful towards women in general. He also kind of started dating this girl named Agnes, which there was a lot of information on their relationship, but I don't know. Like, I just didn't feel like it was worth diving into. He obviously was overly obsessed with her. She liked him enough to date him, but, like, wasn't that interested. She eventually, like, went to college and just kind of left him back, which, you know, was devastating for him, but... Following his junior year, Jeremy phoned his mother from the police station and broke the news that he had been arrested and charged with a DUI. His mother arrived, and on the way home, Jeremy flew into a fit of rage. Um, she kicked him out of the car, which as she should have, and he spent the night on the beach by himself. So it's very much angsty teen. Yeah, I'm above the rules that don't apply to me. And there's not like a rhyme or reason for it. Like I couldn't find anything like there was something going on in his life that was, like, an external factor. Other than, like, being diagnosed with ADD, a, or, yeah, I think ADD, there wasn't, like, a, a diagnosis for anything else or so, like, any internal things. There wasn't – I didn't see anything about abuse or anything going on. Like, there wasn't a reason for what was going on. And then – These fits that Jeremy would throw, like flipping out on his mom after she picked him up from the police station, weren't uncommon. Like, he had kind of snapped on Agnes and would not, I don't think he ever hit her, but he would be slamming his head into doors, freaking out on her. Um, He would lose his crap at parties and... Clearly an unstable individual. Yes, just all around was living this life of like... The world revolves around me, and if you piss me off, then I'm going to let you know that you pissed me off. But even with all these paths, Jeremy kept an even darker secret from those in his life. In the midst of drinking, smoking, doing drugs, getting piercings, and disrespecting his parents, Jeremy was also hiding his obsession with child pornography. Mm. Jeremy frequented sites and downloaded over 800 files of pictures and videos on his computer. In addition, Jeremy would also chat online with other child predators about his fantasies. The night before the crime, he messaged someone asking about his age preferences, and Jeremy responded with, I've never had a chance to try anything, but I fantasize all the time. I don't know, probably about five or six Five or six. Like, <laughs> it's insane. So, let's back up to the day of the crime. I bet you're wondering why a seven-year-old girl was alone in the casino at 3 a.m. I did wonder that when you read it. So, Cherise Iverson was born to Yolanda and Leroy in Long Beach, California. When Yolanda was 15 years old, she met Leroy, who was 45, and a single father. A year later, Yolanda moved in with him and shortly thereafter was pregnant and had to drop out of school. Nevertheless, Leroy adored Cherise and went above and beyond to make her happy. However, despite having very little income, Leroy also adored gambling, especially at the Prima Donna Casino. At 58 years old, Leroy was suffering from several illnesses but decided to take his two children with him on a trip to the casino. Typically on these trips, Leroy would purchase a hotel room for the kids to stay in, but he was short on money, (laughs) and so he just decided to let them freely roam the arcade while he went and played slots and whatever else. As young children do, Cherise left the arcade to check out the casino. I mean, there's buzzers, there's lights, there's whatever. She's seven. She was spotted by a security guard and then taken back to her father. They found him, brought brought her back. And some sources stated that he, like, yelled at the security guard guard and was, like, mad at him. And he was like, you can't let your children run around a casino unsupervised. So in response, Leroy took her back to the arcade to leave her there. As any good parent would. Yes, definitely father of the year. Um, And she escaped, this time, to the casino across the street. Yeah, so they found her, 
they call the casino. They're like, hey, we have a kid. Does anyone, does she belong to anyone there? And they were like, yes, please bring her back. They brought her back. They take her back to Leroy. He then takes her back to the casino. To the arcade? Yeah, to the arcade, to be by herself. With her 15-year-old brother, who disappears. We don't know where he is at the time of the crime. Or I don't. I didn't see anything about where he was. Um, at this point, it was 3.30 in the morning, and Sharice was exhausted. Obviously, I would be tired at 3.30 in the morning, much less a 7-year-old. Um, she sat down in the seat of a race car game and fell asleep. It was at this time that Jeremy and David were strolling into the casino. The two teens were bored. And what I didn't tell you was they had decided to urinate on slot machines and wall sockets. Um, after that excitement worn off, they had approached teenage girls. And Jeremy was showing off his tongue and nipple piercings, as well as his fake ID. Um, obviously, she was not impressed. And so she kind of... I think Put that I think she might have given him her number, but I think that she was just like leave me alone kind of vibes. Um, by this time, Sharice had woken up and began playing with Jeremy. So, question though, didn't you say she was originally throwing wet paper towels with another kid? Yeah, so she was throwing wet paper towels with her brother, who was the fifteen-year-old that she was left with, and then so he was around at three thirty in the morning. Yes. Um, I didn't fully watch all of the camera footage, but I think he's in the vicinity, but I do, he's obviously not in the bathroom because at 15, I mean, right. you're old enough to kind of be like, but maybe he saw that she was playing with this older kid. He was like being really nice to her. Maybe wasn't worried. I mean, he's 15. He's probably not like, oh, this guy is about to hurt my little sister, but he's obviously not in the bathroom at the time that... Well, and he's probably had to keep up with her all night anyway. So yeah. He's probably fed up. Yeah, I mean, it's three, it's after three o'clock in the morning, I can imagine. But, um, so yeah, she's playing with her brother. Jeremy joins in. And after Sharice had escaped him in the ladies' room, Jeremy took a long drag of his cigarette and followed in and proceeded to murder her. So I'll probably place a warning here because this is where it gets kind of a lot. So, as David had left the bathroom, Jeremy was covering Sharice's mouth and touching her inappropriately. He then took off her cowboy boots and her underwear and continued to assault her. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, fearful that someone would hear her scream, he began to strangle her. At that point, he had heard two women enter the bathroom, so Jeremy decided to sit on Sharice's stomach on the toilet so that only one pair of legs would be visible under the stall. So, like, if someone were to look... It would just look like someone using the bathroom. After the women had left, he turned to see that Sharice's breath was labored, and he just assumed she was brain dead. Did not, I mean, there was no other evidence of that, but he just said, oh, I thought she was brain dead. He then snapped her neck, which took several attempts. He placed all of her clothing into a toilet and proceeded to fold up the majority of her body in the bowl as well. So if anyone would look, nothing would be visible from under the stall. He wiped blood and foam from Sharice's mouth off his hand and walked out of the bathroom. As they were leaving, David stressed about video cameras throughout the casino, but Jeremy swore up and down that they weren't working. How would Jeremy know? I don't think, obviously he didn't. I think that he probably, I don't know. This was obviously something he kind of fantasized about. Even if he hadn't fantasized about the murder, this interaction to some degree was something he had planned for. And so I think that he felt that maybe David would be very stressed out about it. Like, dude, like, there's cameras. We're in a casino. There's cameras everywhere. So he was probably just trying to make David feel better about it in any way that he could. He's also 18. So, like, there's no... Not that 18-year-olds are just oblivious and don't know right from wrong, but I think there's no, like, Rational. critical thinking skills in this moment. Luckily for police, video surveillance cameras would document the entire encounter leading up to the crime and following the crime. So, obviously, there weren't cameras in the bathroom, but before and after is all documented. So, you can actually pull up the footage of them 
walking through the casino, playing with her, walking into the bathroom. You can see David leave two minutes later, and then 24 minutes later, you can see Jeremy walk out. The camera is also filmed. Jeremy showing off his tongue piercing and nipple piercing one last time to the valet before leaving the casino. He's so full of himself. Like, I feel like that just speaks so highly to, like, he has no care in the world about what he just did. No care. And I obviously cannot put my head space there because, I don't know, like, I just could never imagine doing this in the first place. But I feel like I would be freaking out. I feel like I would be so panicked, like... Let's get out of here. Yeah, like, let's leave. Like, I'm like, I'm not making... I'm not letting anyone remember me. Like, I'm... But, I'm, like, the valet remembered it enough to say something yeah. about it. Like, so the casino learned of what happened to Charisse, and police began to start investigating. To start, they had local news outlets air the footage of Jeremy and David caught on those video cameras. A boy that went to their school was watching the news with his mother when it aired. And eventually that led to him and his mother turning them into the police. Just three days after returning from their Memorial Day weekend trip, Jeremy was arrested in his home in Long Beach, California. An undercover cop had been watching him. He had taken an entire bottle of his ADD medication and sprinted down the street. So obviously, like, after it had aired... It was obviously stirring a big commotion. People were like, that's obviously Jeremy. It was rumored that David wasn't as much identifiable as Jeremy was. But they knew they had to be together. Yes. So, and like they kind of known about this trip, whatever. And it like really, people, I don't want to say, I don't know. They weren't like encouraging it, but it was almost a popularity thing. Like, holy crap, Jeremy's on the news. Mm. And they're teenagers, so I think it's probably hard to realize the... Gravity? Yeah, the gravity of the situation. Like, I don't know. Leslie Abrams represented Jeremy throughout the legal proceedings. She also represented the Mendez brothers. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Maybe. They were a very high-profile case that was also in California. The trial and lawsuits were insane for this case. There was so many lawsuits and appeals... Like, it was a lot. But, so to start, Jeremy tries to state that he was under the influence and couldn't remember what had happened. And then he tries to blame David for it. I, I wouldn't agree with that. But I, David's non-actions don't sit real well with me. And that's, like, how a lot of people feel. Like, David should have done something. Something. I mean, to sit on the bench for 24, 24 minutes... Knowing that his friend is doing something, he knows he's doing something. He's got to. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I don't say he's to blame, but he sure didn't help. Yeah, David's reaction to this whole ordeal was absolutely disgusting. And I know that he's only 17, 18 at the time, but he was quoted saying some wild things. So I'll read you some of his interview questions. So he was asked, were you appalled that your friend said he had killed a little girl? Here was David's response. I am not going to get upset over somebody else's life. Oh. I just worry about myself first. So that was what he had to say to that. Then he was asked, did Jeremy make any mention in regard to her appearance or sexuality or anything about her? This is what he said to that. Well, nothing serious. I mean, we always joke around. I mean, like, you know, those little girls, you know, yum, yummy this and that. But it was always in a joking manner. I'm sorry. I have never once in my life joked about the sexuality of children. Never once have I ever even considered. There was also a source that stated that, after, like, when they were getting in the car to leave the casino, David asked her if she was sexually aroused. During the interaction. David asked who? Der David asked Jeremy that. Yeah, David asked Jeremy if Sharice was sexually aroused during the interaction. Are you kidding me? No. And when he was asked why he asked that, he was just like, I don't know. That's just how I think. Okay, so say this again. David asked Jeremy. 
David, after the crime took place, and they're getting in the car to leave the casino, the two teenage boys, right. Jeremy and David, David looks at Jeremy and asks him, was she, meaning Charisse, or Charisse, was she sexually aroused? So he's essentially admitting that he knows he did something to that little girl. Essentially. But how disgusting. And not even that, like... Who asked that? Who sits there and is like, you know, like, even who thinks that way? If that's his excuse. This poor baby girl. So I feel like this, this whole like nonchalant vibe towards Jeremy's actions kind of is what I saw from every person in Jeremy's life. Like his parents kind of chalked up like this tea totally horrible, not okay behavior to like oh he's just it's just senioritis like he's just scared to leave his friend those kind of vibes and then so everybody made an excuse for him yes and his friends would be like oh he he's just being like we're just being teenagers you know yeah who cares that he threw an egg at a sex worker what teenager is even with sex workers like that is where his behavior was and every single source was like oh like he was just going through his, uh, through a lot at the time. Hmm. And I'm not saying that their lack of initi- initiative is what caused this, but it didn't help. <laughs> it sure didn't help. It didn't help. Oh, so one of their one of Jeremy and David's friends at school. I don't know if the exact story of David had kind of confided in this other friend about the incident once, like, the news news footage was aired. But David was trying to push this friend to go to the police before someone actually did go to the police. He was like, hey, you need to go do this. And he didn't. So he didn't go to the police. And when this guy was asked why he didn't listen to David and go to the police, he spent a while just basically being like, well... I talked to so many other guys and they would not turn their best friends in for murdering somebody. It's just a guy thing. Like what? we need to, yeah, we need to like respect each other. And like, I just, I just wouldn't want to turn. I don't want to like narc on my friend was like the whole vibe of this guy. So it's not just David being casual. It's not just Jeremy being casual. It's not just their third friend being casual. Like so many people involved in this case were so laid back about the whole ordeal like it wasn't somebody's life that was taken jeremy ended up taking a plea bargain and pled guilty to first degree murder first degree kidnapping sexual assault on a minor with substantial bodily harm and sexual assault on a minor so question yes was her dad in any way held responsible for any of this were there any charges Um, filed against him No, which it's actually kind of crazy because I saw one source say that when he even found out about it, he asked for a hotel room. Oh, Uh so it's the hotel's responsibility now to to comp him a room since his daughter's been killed by his negligence. He, it wasn't necessarily, I don't, I don't think he was an okay action, 112%. Like, he was so in the wrong and put his addiction way above his daughter. But, and I don't think you're saying this, but it also does not make Jeremy's actions any less okay. Right. Um, but, yeah, he was totally, like, flippant about it. I don't, I mean, obviously he was upset. Like, I'm not going to sit here. I don't know his mindset, but a security guard or someone at, working at the casino basically said that he asked for a hotel room, $100, and a, and a case of beer. And any good parents should. Right. I And we didn't really hear... I couldn't find anything else about his reaction or anything like that. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say that he wasn't upset or that. Right. Because we don't. We, don't, we have no idea. And, like, so many sources that he really loved Sharice and, like, he was the first person in line to pick her up every single. Like, he was there 30 minutes early to pick her up from school every day and did everything. Like, he doted over her. So, I don't want to sit here and say that he didn't care or that, you know. But I'm also not going to say his actions were okay either. Jeremy was sentenced to four life terms 
to be served consecutively without parole. First, he was put in a maximum security prison and then moved to a medium security prison. I'm not sure exactly why he was moved, but he went from being heavily policed to not so much. Of course, he appealed his sentence and was basically saying that he was forced to confess or that the confession was forced out of him kind of thing. Um, But he was unsuccessful. Jeremy is now 45 and is still incarcerated in Nevada, I believe. During Sharice's funeral, um, which was held on May 31st, 1997, at the Paradise Baptist Church, her parents, so Yolanda and Leroy, set apart. And they never mended their relationship. This obviously drove them apart even farther. I would imagine. Um, And they did not, they haven't, apparently, we obviously don't know, but they have not spoken since their daughter's death. This was a quote from one of her, one of the sources talking about Sharice stated, Sharice's teachers thought of her as affectionate and trusting. Her hair was neatly braided. Her clothes looked freshly ironed. She struggled with reading was scared of the dark, and adored the Little Mermaid. She loved the color purple, and she wanted to be a nurse, or a policewoman, or a model, or a dancer. That's terrible. I think reading stuff like that is harder, because whenever you're just researching it, you kind of lose, like, the humanity side of it, that, like, this was somebody's daughter, this was a living person, and so stuff like that always makes me so sad for the family and for her like she her life was completely cut short and it seemed like there was no rem reason other than his like sick twisted fantasies so violently and quickly like she was not peaceful it's just I hate to put my kids to bed mad at them I can't imagine them leaving life in that state of mind so as I mentioned earlier there were several lawsuits in conjunction with this case One of the lawsuits was in October of 1999, and Winnie and John basically attempted to sue the social worker that allowed, that, like, initiated the adoption of Jeremy to their family in a $1 million lawsuit. Um, It was specifically against the Los Angeles County and its adoption workers. They basically had claimed that the state or the county had left out information about Jeremy's past. He was a newborn. What kind of past did he have? Right. So his mom um, was diagnosed with chronic schizophrenia. Okay. His father was serving, I want to say, a 30-year sentence at the time. And I don't think it was for a violent crime, but he was in prison. And then he had siblings and half-siblings with similar issues. Okay. And I'm not saying that because his parents and family were that way that he was destined to be, to turn out to be this violent criminal. But I do feel like that information is important to even disclose to someone. Yes. Yes. So um, I'm not exactly sure the outcome of that case. So that is the tragic story of Sharice Iverson. I will make you feel a little bit better about Nevada and their decision going forward after this case. They passed a law that made it a crime that if you know of a minor that is under the age of 16 that is being sexually abused or assaulted, you have to then report it. So they created a bystander law. And this has been kind of controversial because, well, even the only reason I landed on this case was because we were talking about bystander laws in my criminal law class and how it's kind of hard to limit the scope of that, which I feel like Nevada did a good job because who's to say, like, if you're driving down the street and you see someone get in a car accident, you know, if it's on a highway, how many people pass by? So, like, bystander laws are hard to create in that aspect because who do they apply to? Are we going to prosecute every single person that drove down I-6? Like, how would we even do that? But Nevada did create this law. Um, It's called the Sharice Iverson Bill, and it was enacted in 2000. There's also been a heavy increase of security at the Nevada casinos, especially in like the arcade and like areas that children frequent. Everybody there is supposed to be an adult. I, I don't know. I guess like, I know 
adults do enjoy. They're at the casino. They enjoy gaming, gaming in some aspects. So I don't know if it's like maybe at the prima donna there are other, you know, like we have horse racing here in Arkansas. And so we can go horse racing even if you're a kid, but you can't actually enter the casino. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know the ins and outs. It was also 1997. So, like, I don't exactly know what the ins and outs of the prima donna were. Like, if there were other attractions that were kid-friendly. Either way, maybe it should close at (laughs) 10, 11, maybe. You know, like, I don't know any seven-year-old that should be in an arcade, even if it wasn't in a casino, at 3.30 in the morning. Right. There are so many things that could have been done to prevent her death. Uh, 100%. And I feel like so many people feel so strongly towards David in that aspect. Like, no, Leroy was not making the correct decision, but that doesn't constitute his daughter being murdered. So what are your guys' thoughts on this case? I know, for me, it was super hard researching and looking into just because, I mean, I feel like crimes to children are so much harder to accept or hear because you are cutting short the life of somebody who is so innocent and has so much life to live. We hope that you enjoyed listening to this week's episode. We will not be back next week, but we hope you tune in in two weeks for a brand new episode. Thank you for listening. Bye guys. Bye.